Chris Fleming. Welcome back to this month's edition of Spirit Talk. It is February 2016. Our guest this month is a lecturer in the Division of Psychology at the University of Northampton and a member of its Center for the Study of Anomalous Psychological Processes. His research and teachings covers topics as parapsychology, anomalous experiences, death and bereavement, and positive psychology. Now, he's a member of the Society for Psychical Research, the Parapsychological Association, and a fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a chartered member of the British Psychological Society. It's a lot of things there. Now, but he's also an author and editor of several books on parapsychological topics, such as Telephone Calls from the Dead, Conversations with Ghosts, and Paracoustics, Sound and the Paranormal. He holds awards in parapsychology such as the Ellen J. Garrett Scholarship, the Alex Tanuis Scholarship Award, and the Dr. Gertrude Schmiedler Award. Please welcome to the show parapsychologist and lecturer Callum E. Cooper, better known as Cal. Welcome to the show, Cal. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Great speaking to you. Now, I came across your information, and I'm excited to have you as a guest this month because one of your popular research topics and books is phone calls from the dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm never going to escape from that now. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been a big fan and a researcher for, geez, almost 40 years now in ITC. And mm -hmm. I've always heard about phone calls from the dead as a form of ITC. I personally have never received a phone call from the dead. I was tricked as a kid in grade school. Some friends of mine played a trick on me and pretended they were a ghost on the phone. But I've always been intrigued about this. So tell me, how did you focus? What made you focus on phone calls from the dead? Ooh, that's now a long show in itself, just that one <laughs> question. <laughs> um, when I was at um, university as an undergraduate, when I was studying psychology, and I'd taken that particular degree program because I knew I could study parapsychology in the third year and, and do a, t a dissertation project on it, um, I, I was kind of obsessed as you are. You've gone there for that specific reason. So I was probably reading more parapsychology than I was about child psychology or cognitive psychology. And I was reading a lot of books by um, a researcher from California called D. Scott Rogan, mm -hmm. who um, lectured at John F. Kennedy University and a few other places, held membership to the same place as I do. And um, he'd been a, a research assistant on EVP projects with another guy from California called Raymond Bayless, who was a veteran psychical researcher, extremely knowledgeable on how psychical research set up from the rise of spiritualism and so forth in the 1800s. So they're a good working team when it came to early lab studies of electronic voice phenomena. And they hired, hired out an apartment in California that was soundproof to test this whole idea of electronic voices and can we receive strange rap sounds and voices and so forth in controlled conditions where there's no room for error or fraud. Um, but while they were doing this, a few people came to them and said, uh, oh, that's interesting that you're doing that. Um, I've had something that might interest you, and that's a, a telephone call from someone that um, I believe was dead at the time. And they'd never heard of this, so they just shrugged it off. But then, you know, a few more people came forward and in 1977, they believed we should really take this seriously uh, and look into this. So they went through all the parapsychology journals and available books that they had and interviewed more people, spoke to psychologists and parapsychologists who had some of these cases on file, didn't know what to do with them. And that led to a two-year project in creating a book that they co-authored called Phone Calls from the Dead. And as an undergraduate, I stumbled across this, picked it up and... Uh, uh, through some other circumstances of seeing in the news some people claiming that they'd had such experiences, I thought it was time to revive it and look into it again because no one had touched it for 30 years. Well, I find that fascinating. In this topic, I want to delve into deeply uh, regarding this form of ITC. But what I've noticed, it, and this thing is, I want to pay you a lot of respect. I mean, you're, you're, you're pretty young, right? How old are you? Do you don't mind uh, 20, I'm 27. 27. <laughs> I think that is fantastic, and here's why is, you know, we got people that have been in the field for a long time, people that, uh, but they haven't contributed much. And I'm taking mm -hmm. a look at, you've got three books out. You're a part of all these research associations and involved in all these studies. And I find that fascinating because age really does not matter. What matters is your contributions and how much you are actually studying and research. So I want to pay you respect in that. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, Scott Roger went down the same route. I, I think he kind of entered the field 
around the age of 15, 16, he started doing the EVP research with Raymond Bayless, and he published his first book as an undergraduate um, in, while he was in California. I think it was at Northridge College or something like that. I've totally forgotten, but, you know, he, he was publishing like mad, around about 30 books by the time that he passed away and over 100 research papers. So um, the, the few people that just got into parapsychology and just kept going, kept publishing, kept writing, kept researching. Well, see, that's that's great. And to take a look at you, your story, your biography, you know, a lot of people are going to be like, well, who is Cal? You know, mm -hmm. how did you get involved in the paranormal field? Did you have an experience? What led you to this direction and path? Well, it's, it's very poignant bringing that one up now because I get asked that um, all the time how I got involved in this. And it was, um, funnily enough, m my grandmother was really the driving force for sort of um, spurring me on and, and saying, you know, if you want to study this, you should do it. But years before that, I grew up going to Newstead Abbey with her, which is just around the corner. It's about 10 minutes away. It's the former home of Lord Byron, the poet. And that has three specific ghosts. And she used to take me and my sister there all the time as as children. And she passed away only yesterday morning. So oh, that's the last. Yeah, yeah that, that's the last of my grandparents gone. But it's very uh, sort of poignant that um, all this kind of stuff and the research that I'm doing now has uh, sort of come up. And um, so, yeah, she really got me involved. And out of all my parents and grandparents, you know, she she's the main one that said, if you want to do this, do it. A lot of people have these experiences you know, there must be something going on. Um, so if that's what you want to do as a career path, get into it. So, you know, later on, after being fascinated by Newstead Abbey, having ghosts of the white lady, the um, boss and the dog and the black friar and uh, what Byron wrote about these things. Beyond that, I was fascinated in hauntings anywhere in Nottingham, where I live. Uh, we claim to have the two oldest pubs in the world. Uh, one of them being the Salutation Inn that, that's got, I think, wood in the building from the 1300s. Uh, that builds the property, and um, then stuff dating back even further. So when it came to college, I just thought, is this really possible? I picked a mixture of topics like mm -hmm. electronics, photography, general studies, sign language, filmmaking, and, and stuff like that. But obviously, I picked psychology. And my tutors then were very sort of discouraging of it because there had been a lot of um, TV shows of the time, mm -hmm. And they said, well, this is just mindless running about in the dark with night vision cameras. There's no actual study to it. In fact, one of the psychologists who enrolled me at college, she said, when she saw at the bottom of my form, you know, any future career aspirations, I put parapsychologist. And she said, uh, I think I best tell you now, there is no such a thing. That there is no such <laughs> oh, thing on. as a parapsychologist. And oh, I said, well, on. that's a bit odd because they actually know several. And, you know, now I know practically all of them now I'm in the mix um, there's about 300 of them officially worldwide you know working um, either part-time or have dabbled and they've gone through a career route of it right. and so once you're in the field you all know each other but it was that I, I stuck to my guns I studied generic psychology and when it came to picking a university I went and looked at all the ones or the ones that I was interested in that had taught modules of parapsychology and therefore I could do a dissertation on it as well and so I considered Hertfordshire, Professor Richard Wiseman's there. Um, I looked at Coventry. It was doing a master's degree in parapsychology at the time um, and a few other places. But I, I finally settled for the University of Northampton because um, since 2004, it took over from the University of Edinburgh and became the world's largest research department for parapsychology. We've probably got about um, 12 to 15 active staff members at the moment, mm. and that ranges from graduate research assistants, master's students, through to PhD students and full-time uh, members of staff. So we really are a big department with e each of us having our own individual niche of what we specialize in, in researching. So I'm probably the main and only person right now interested in, in ghosts and hauntings compared to everyone else. Cal, that's fascinating because you're very fortunate, uh, especially this time and day and age, you know, to have access to... You know, the classes, the uh, professors, and the organizations to become a part of You okay? Oh, jeez. There is, uh, Cal, in all my years doing this since 2007, I have not been disconnected. What had happened was, showed up on my computer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. 
four times the power went off, went on, went off, went on. I got the window shows up warning. You're now running on backup power. So what happens is regardless of the power going out in my house in the neighborhood, it uh, shuts off, tends to disconnect certain functions of the computer. Even though the computer stays on, anything uh, peripherals that are connected get cut off. Oh, geez. Um, I've never had that happen before while I've done this, and all my listeners know that. Um, especially for it to happen four repeated times in a row. Boom, 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 boom. Four windows showed up. That means it went off, went on, went off, went on, went off, went on. Now, we do have power outages occasionally in the neighborhood, uh, very infrequent, but to have four in a row like that, that's, that's I'm not going to call it paranormal, but I'm going to say that is completely odd, and uh, that's all I can say about it. So what I will end up doing is I will edit this show uh, to continue us. I will have that cut off in there, but I will... I will put the two audio segments together, so and I'll sure. edit this part out. You know, the the past two shows I think I did via Skype, the same thing happened. Me too. The, the same thing happened, and hey, same thing happened, and they said that it never happened to them either until that point. Um, it, I guess it's a consequence of having the telephone guy on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say this with uh, fact: is some of my other guests over the years, we've recorded EVPs during our phone conversations. And a lot of my listeners know that because they've written to me saying there's an EVP. And when I've done the editing stages, I found the EVPs. So we always know they're always listening to us consciousness and they can butt in at any time they want. Sometimes they will even support or compliment something we're saying. So we'll leave it at that. But what I was saying, and I'm not sure what, where we got cut off is I'm fascinated the fact that you're so fortunate that you're able to have access to these courses as well as to have access to other colleagues that are studying and researching the same type of phenomenon. Now, we, don't, we do have some things like that here in the United States, but I know when I was going to college in the 80s, we didn't have anything like that. The closest we had to parapsychology or any form of psychic or mediumship study was abnormal psychology. <laughs> yeah. And that's basically mental disorders. So you can imagine me in the back row raising my hand going, you know, Professor, with all these studies of manic depression, schizophrenia, and hallucinations, has any study been done that these people are communicating with the same entity or seeing the same thing, but it's being labeled as hallucination? Mm -hmm. I was completely ignored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've been in generic courses again before, and to even... It, the interesting thing about parapsychology is not only has it got the most rigorous research methods of most of the social sciences, if not the sciences, because of the claims that it's testing. And it first introduced kind of um, using statistics as well in social sciences. But if you were to branch it into any other area of psychology where those lecturers aren't familiar, they just get so uncomfortable and just dismiss it out of hand. And usually they've never read into it, but it's interesting to see their reaction to it. And yet they'll have a good go at trying to make sense of a, a link with another generic area of psychology. You know, if you start mentioning someone having um, anomalous processes going on, some form of psychic process, or even consciousness surviving after death, that, that's it. They just think you're studying the wacky stuff. There's nothing to it. There's no evidence for it. That's always the main claim. There's no evidence for this. You know, look at, at any specialist library. There's loads and loads of this. The Journal of Parapsychology has been going since 1937. Um, the Society of Psychic Research, they've had a proceedings going since 1882. And with the Journal of Parapsychology through Duke University in North Carolina, they, um, before they actually had their established journal, as you say, they were publishing in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and other places like that because they didn't know what is the suitable output for this kind of stuff. It wasn't standard psychical research. It wasn't going to look into haunted houses or look at um, seances that are occurring. It's, we brought someone into the lab, we're testing their psychic abilities, here's our output. So it, it didn't really fit generic psychical research. It needed to go in a psychology journal. And uh, they just got a lot of um, hostility from that. And J.B. Ryan's very first conference, apparently he screwed it up, um, not through his fault, but his own fault. Someone came to him and said, one of your participants was cheating. They were just repeating their score on the Zener cards. They were just following a pattern. And luckily, Ryan had taken all of his raw data to, uh, to the conference with him. So a couple of his research assistants, they got together and looked through all the raw data, found this um, sort of significant outlier, this person who'd been repeating their scores, deleted their scores, and then recalculated 
the whole and, that, and to do that all by hand must have taken so long still had a significant effect yeah. But at, at the standard psychology conference, trying to argue the case for parapsychology, I, I think nerves just got the better of him, and it just really wasn't well received. And they just thought from that point, you know what, we need our own standardized, peer reviewed journal on parapsychology. And so Duke University started publishing one. And the good thing about his book, Extrasensory Perception, which he published not saying, I'm preaching the gospel here, I'm just showing you what I did, and we got significant effects. So take this book, take our methods, adapt them, if you will, to make them better and let us know what results you get. All I'm saying is these methods seem to work. So the Journal of Parapsychology was fantastic for those people, those other psychologists who were cautious of parapsychology. They tested it for themselves, and no matter what their results, if they found something or didn't find something, the Journal of Parapsychology would publish it. And that's, again, a big difference with parapsychology journals. It publishes things when you didn't find anything. Sure. The standard protocol for other journals in other areas is we don't publish things where they didn't find anything. So you right. never know how many studies they did where they didn't find something compared to how many times they did it where they did. You could have 19 crap studies and one really good one. So you only see the good one, but clearly there was nothing going on. If the 19 times you ran it, you didn't find anything. That one is just a, it was a coincidence that it just had the right statistics at that point. Yeah, that's it. You know... You talk about parapsychology and psychology, and for those listening, you know, psychology obviously is study of the brain, and the uh, majority of the psychologists believe that the mind, personality, and consciousness exists in the brain, and it comes from the brain. Parapsychology deviated from that and believed that the mind, consciousness, can exist outside the brain, and it can influence not only other people, but can influence also or be affected by the environment, uh, because it is in the electromagnetic field, or it could be somewhere else, whether it's non-locality. That's what's fascinating about parapsychology, and, and I'll say this to you coming from the United States, is some psychologists are starting to become more open-minded. I had a conversation uh, three years ago with a psychologist in Illinois. He's on the board of, of psychology in Illinois in the United States. 57 years he's been in the field. Now, this guy's in his 70s. He stated to me, he said, Chris, listen, psychology, the practice of and study of it, it's only been around for about 100 years, okay? When you talk about ghosts, spirits, communication with the afterlife that's been going on for thousands of years in many different cultures and different societies so there's no way that we can say definitely to uh, you know debunk that it doesn't exist because we're still trying to figure out the brain he says i don't believe in any of that i believe just in the brain when the brain dies we die but i cannot say with any certainty with my 57 years that we are 100 percent right because we're not to hear that from someone that is very respected, I was like, wow, you know, he's not debating with me. He's not arguing with me. He's just saying the way it is. And I mm -hmm. respect that. Yeah. yeah. There was a story like that that um, I heard recently from um, a colleague at uh, Cambridge University and uh, Dr. Andreas Summers is named Summer. And uh, he teaches the history of science. And within that, his specialist field is the history of psychical research. So looking at William James and... Um, uh, all the uh, founding members of the Societies for Psychic Research, the British and American branch. And um, I was asking him when I saw him back in October, I, I said, you know, what are some of the kind of high up people at Cambridge thinking uh, about your involvement in the history of science? What do they think to parapsychology? And he said, well, the funny thing was one guy that is really kind of high up in, in Cambridge, really well known and in the uh, of areas of philosophy and so forth, um, Andreas got to speak to him and uh, was having a long chat and was talking about parapsychology and um, him teaching it there and uh, spoke about the phenomena. And I've forgotten what led to the, this kind of final comment, but that this um, distinguished professor just said, uh, I don't see why anyone's got a problem with that. That stuff happens all the time. What's your problem? You know, is it, is it, you know, do we really need to study? It's obvious that stuff happens. There's more important issues. And so it's like, you know, it's so obvious that people see ghosts all the time or have these um, spontaneous psychic events of a premonition day to day or a telepathic event. And can we not just accept that it's going on and move on? <laughs> and that was his attitude. And he said, of course it is. You know, are you an idiot or something? That is fantastic. You know, Cal, with all your studies, research, and everything you get involved with, you know, you've written three books, Telephone Calls from the Dead, Conversations with Ghosts, and Paracoustics, Sound in the Paranormal. What is anomalous telephonic communication? And did I say that right? Yeah, anomalous telephonic communication. Um, I 
I kind of gave it a really fancy title when I published a full report on it in the Journal of Parapsychology. I think I call it tele telecommunication technology or something like that. Just expand a really neat title. Um, it's basically anyone that reports that they've had an um, anomalous communication with someone either known to be dead at the time that the call took place or someone who couldn't possibly have been by a telephone at the time that the call took place. Um, and then there's also people who claim that they've had a telephone call from aliens as well. So those are the three main things that could crop up when someone says that they've had a, an anomalous telephonic event. Well, you've got, you go back to Tesla, you know, you got Marconi, Tesla, uh, and Edison, you know, Edison didn't believe what mm -hmm. uh, Tesla was saying until uh, possibly later in his life. But Tesla believed with his uh, coil and with the uh, electromagnetic field, he was communicating with aliens or, or beings from somewhere else. Now, you know, that's public knowledge, and I guess there's stuff to support that. You know, I wish we had the actual recordings. I haven't been able to get access to that or find anything like that. We have to wonder, who was he talking to? Was he talking to spiritual entities, uh, you know, uh, consciousness, or was he talking to aliens? Mm -hmm. In your findings, and, and I don't really want to get into aliens. While I do believe there's other life forms out there, let's focus on the spiritual aspect. Mm -hmm. Have you heard some compelling evidence of phone calls or, or answering machines of voices from the dead? Yeah, I've heard some answer machine ones. Those are the only ones you're ever really going to get, really, because the chance of capturing um, a live telephone call from the dead as it occurs, as someone interprets it to be that, is the same as trying to catch that ghost in action witness. It. Usually you've just got the aftermath of someone giving you an eyewitness account of what happened. Um, at least with the telephone calls, you can follow up with the call company, what happened. There might be multiple witnesses. So with the answer phones, I've heard some neat ones where repeatedly someone came on saying, hi, dad, hi, dad, you know, several years after that person had died and there, there was no reason for it to have suddenly cropped up at a significant time. Um, but I'll, I'll go into a more interesting story with one of them that I just thought if, if the conventional explanations that I brought up don't apply, then I really am lost as to what was going on. And it was, uh, it was presented to me by an ex lecturer at the University of Bristol who um, specialised in psychology and sociology and uh, gained his doctorate some time before that. And when the professor, the chair of professorship for parapsychology came up at Edinburgh, he was considering applying for it. But the uh, Californian parapsychologist Bob Morris, he, he came over and he got it and saw about 30 to 40 people gain their PhDs in parapsychology. Um, I digress. Um, <laughs> What happened was uh, this guy, um, I called him Dr. Jones for the sake of the account. Um, he recalls a time when he was about 11. This was here in the UK. Um, his mother and father had split up but were still living at home together amicably because they both had to stay to then if they were going to move on, get different properties. And they had two or three kids. And Dr. Jones, I think, being at the time 11, their, their middle eldest. And uh, his father had started dating. And... Um, his mother had started being a childhood sweetheart again. And um, things, again, were still amicable with both of these ex-partners still coming back to the same household for the sake of their kids. And uh, this was all happening very soon after the break. Well, but she would have, his mother would have regular conversations with this guy called um, Richard. And she would take the kitchen phone, take it into the bathroom. They'd have 20, 30 minute conversations. And uh, it was a weekly thing, probably three to four times a week, this guy would call. Uh, several months in, this guy had become ill, visited him in hospital, and then she was taking calls from him from the hospital as well. And then one day, a call came in saying that he died, and she had her ex-husband check with the hospital, and, you know, so distraught, is this true, what's happened? And it turned out, indeed, he passed away. And uh, she was very grief-stricken, and then a few weeks later, um, usual time she would get a call, a, a call came in and they just thought it's going to be you know, someone that we know calling us. And she went away to answer the phone and came back after the 20, 30 minutes or so white as a sheet. And Dr. Jones and some of the other family members said, uh, what's wrong? And she said, Richard called. And they just didn't know what to do or what to make of it. You can't call the police, the fire service ambulance, you can't dial 999 or 911 and find out what's What's going on? Can any of these emergency services shed light on it? You can't call the Ghostbusters. People, people weren't really familiar with the Societies for Psychical Research. 
Sometimes there were. I mean, a lot of fantastic reports have gone through the correct channels to the SPR um, societies, communities, sorry. And, um, but they didn't know, and they didn't know anyone involved in the research, so what did they do? They just accepted it. If these calls were coming in, they accepted it as the norm. It wasn't just that one off. Every week, three to four times a week, this guy would call, and she would take the calls, and she would go into the bathroom. This happened for two to three years until the calls just gradually died down. And at that time, she kept a five-year diary. So that two, two to three years' worth of calls were documented within this five-year diary. And one time she went out, she was shopping, usually about the time the calls would come in, and Dr. Jones was home. I think maybe one of his siblings was there. The phone rang, he picked it up. And he even rem remembers to this day that instead of just hearing a voice straight away, he said he heard the sound of wind, static, a voice in the distance gradually coming forward. And he said he was so petrified, he just shouted, she's not here, and slammed the phone down. And he said how he regrets that now because later on in life he recounted these strange phone calls that his mother was having. No one ever shed light on them. He bought Rogo and Bayless's book, Phone Calls from the Dead, the 1979 edition, read that and found so many links between their cases and his. So he represented it to me um, in 2010, I think, something like that. And we just went through everything. He presented uh, an 11-page eyewitness account, I think, so he, he tried to remember everything he could about them. And his mother had died some six years beforehand, so he said he'd managed to get hold of the diary. And uh, he scanned, scanned it in for me, and I got to see several pages, and it's just bizarre, because every single phone call that's documented is, is very kind of scripted. It's, it repeats itself. Thursday morning, my darling called to say that he loved me and would always be at my side. I felt lonely today, and he said, I'm with you, and I felt better. I struggled to sleep, and he says, now you will sleep, and then I would sleep. Goodbye, my darling, I will speak to you again on the wind. Friday morning, my darling called to say that he loved me, and it just go on and on and on for every page. So, if this wasn't something to do with, say, um, a prank based on the relationship breakup between um, his mother and father, um, if it was a prank... Um, you know, all credit due to the prankster for continuing this so consistently three to four times a week for two to three years. Wow. That, you know, that's carrying out quite a long prank, uh, prank just to um, kind of, I, I don't know. I mean, she didn't seem to suffer any kind of um, psychological stress from this. These were very comforting. But it's kind of cruel if you know that you are keeping up the prank and pretending to be the deceased on the phone. And, you know, there's no honesty in it there, but you'd also want to know what are the motives behind this. Has she, up, has she upset someone and they thought this would be funny and actually it's gone the opposite way because she's taking comfort from it? So if that's not it, um, I, I don't know what is. We explored some other avenues. It's clearly not an electrical fault. They were standard telephone calls. Um, it's, these happened in the 60s, so there's no way of going back and checking with the call company where they were coming from. His death was confirmed. Um, but she was adamant that it was him. And when you take Dr. Jones's account of what he heard when he picked them up, there was about 30 to 40 percent in Rogo and Bayless cases, as there were in mine, of people reporting the additional element of not only did I recognize their voice, but I heard static on the line as well mixed in, or it sounded like they were yelling from the other side of the room, or their voice sounded very hollow. So there were different voice characteristics even though their voice was recognisable, and they'd have personality traits and specific knowledge that only the receiver of the call would know about. So for me, that was the most remarkable case out of probably the 50 I looked into. Well, it was 50. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you say, you know, I'm sitting here thinking back going, sure, I've got a lot of EVPs, a lot of this and that. I've heard other people tell me their stories about where they've got on their answering machine and they had a message of somebody that just passed away and they didn't even know yet. It happened that night or whatever, and they left a message, um, as well as people that got calls with static. I did get called once on my cell phone. Now, this goes back probably about eight, nine years. I got a call on my cell phone, and I, that day I had a conversation with one of my girlfriends at the time regarding uh, EVPs and, and, and hearing spirits' voices, and I relayed to her that a friend of mine I went to college with told me he got a response on a payphone. He was saying something. If somebody's really out there, you know, just give me a sign, you know. And he heard a phone ringing on a payphone, so he walked over, picked it up, and there was all this static. And he freaked out. You know, he says, well, was it a coincidence or was it a message? I told her that story, and later that day my phone rang, and it was all static. And there was no number. It was showing 00000 on the phone, and, and that was it. 
So was that a coincidence or was that actually something saying, hey, we, we can hear you? Mm. Well, what? with the, with the, with the payphone, no, possibly a prank. I mean, the amount of times as an undergraduate and before that, I've taken payphone numbers and then gone, gone and sat in town at a, a bench nearby with friends and you're calling it, just waiting who will actually come along and answer that call and then thinking up something funny you can say when they, they answer it. Um, but with, you say you got, was it a text or well, a call remember, that, that just... That, with the phone call, with the uh, pay phone, that was back in 1983. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and did, the, did the pay, also, uh, yeah, mobile phone. It was one of, it's one of the glass cases you go in, you open up, sure. and there's the silver cord going to the phone you take off. You know, so that's prior to, I think, isn't that prior to cell phones? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they just start to really be coming in as those big bricks yeah. <laughs> and uh, carrying a big battery pack around with you. So the, the only other thing is if someone actually had taken one of the number and then really wanted to take that home and use a landline to call that payphone and just see who picks up and when, you know, it's a, it's a long possible um, conventional explanation. It's not something we should rule out. I mean, John Randall, um, another parapsychologist and uh, late colleague of mine, he passed away several years ago. We, we spoke frequently about these and he said, always remember one of the top things to look at in terms of these having explanations is fraud. And especially for replicating a phone call from the dead or anything like that, it's incredibly cruel. But he said, you know, humans by their very nature are really cruel and can often be so. So don't ever rule it out and think people could never be that cruel. They can't. Right. Um, and that even goes as far as, you know, making prank calls all the time. And, you know, that sometimes they can be misinterpreted as being that of a deceased person. I mean, one that I think can frequently crop up is someone that loses a son or daughter and they're in a state of grief and a child calls home to their parents and uh, they just, when they hear the phone being answered, they just go, mum, dad. And then that person distraught gives an answer and that person realizes it's not their mum or dad, they've misdialed. But how many people are called mum and dad? They're going to respond to it. It's enough for that child to put the phone down and not make apologies. But for the person that received it, it's enough to confirm that their child has survived. And it was a really weird, weird call and there's no need to follow it up. So that kind of coincidence, misinterpretation can lead in so many instances to uh, a presumed phone call from the dead. I mean, those kinds I, I left out of my analysis just because there was not enough information within the case. There's no conversation being carried out. And there's no follow-up with the phone companies to say that something unusual was going on. It's a standard coincidence that we could expect. But sure, maybe within that, maybe there might be something going on that we can't explain. But it's hard or more, more or less impossible in those cases to separate wheat from the chaff. You know, they're mixed and they'll permanently be mixed. Yeah, well said. So, so for people listening, what are the different call types that can or have been identified? Well, Rogan Bayliss identified um, four from a content analysis. And then when I redid it 30 years on, I found that maybe there was um, an additional one. So they did a content analysis just to look at frequencies of themes. And then I took these themes and uh, looked at if there were any kind of alternative themes or additional themes or deviations from it. And I found that I, I could fit one in the middle called mixed calls. So if we start with the first one, first one is called type one calls. They're called simple calls. And that's where you've lost someone close to you. You're obviously aware of it. You're in a state of grief. You're at home. The phone rings and maybe you hear their voice and static. They say your name and they're unresponsive and their voice might just fade out. No particular conversation, just a few moments, few words, and you never hear a click of the receiver going down. So those are simple calls. Uh, type two prolonged calls, um, they could be where you receive a conversation from your friend called Joe. Joe talks about going on a, a particular fishing trip that you planned and then for whatever reason says, I, I think I'm going to have to cancel it, but you go, you go on your own. Um, you know, we'll reschedule for some other time or something like that. Puts, puts all kinds of blockades in and excuses and stuff like that. And you put the phone down. Let's say your friend uh, David turns up at the door. He seems really quite distraught. You ask David what's wrong. And he said, oh, you hear, um, Joe died in the car crash yesterday. And you're like, well, he kind of don't know. I've just been speaking to him on the phone for a good half an hour. In recounting that telephone call, you realize that a lot of things that he said, that person said, were very final and really uncharacteristic of them. But it was definitely them. It was their characteristics and so forth. 
in some instances of those types of cases, the person has said, uh, you know, when they've had this conversation, uh, the person that they've called says, where are you right now? And they said, oh, I'm in a very beautiful place or I'm going away right now. So like they are entering some sort of transition or have already done so. Um, so those are interesting prolonged. They had no knowledge at the time that anyone had died. There's no reason to presume they're going to have a paranormal experience or expect a telephone call from the dead. The vast majority of people that have these aren't familiar with parapsychology and are certainly not familiar with people having these types of experience. They're quite a niche within experiences from sensing the presence of the dead to seeing apparitions or poltergeist activity. Type three, these are called um, answer calls. So you make them. You go intending to call someone, and again, the same thing could happen with like prolonged. You get an answer from someone you didn't know was dead at the time, but after the call, you find that out. Or you call someone who answered, you had the conversation with them, but it later turns out that they didn't follow up some of the things that you said because it turns out they couldn't possibly have been in um, at the time the call took place by their landline, landline telephone. And yet for you, on your side of things, they definitely did. They picked up, you called their landline, you had a conversation with them, it was their characteristics, and yet they were verified to have been somewhere else that day with other people. So who answered the phone, who had their voice characteristics, and who had their knowledge? Those are really interesting, and that happened a few times um, for Rogo and Bayless. Um, Raymond Bayless had run, uh, rung Scott Rogo a few times, and Scott was living with a, uh, a flatmate at the time, so shared apartment. And that guy would answer. Um, it, certainly on one occasion, that guy answered and said, oh, Scott's not here at the moment. Um, can I take a message? And Raymond said, yeah, sure. I need to speak to him about this, this and this. Just tell him to call me straight back. Four days would go by and Raymond would get really annoyed that Scott hadn't called back. And um, so he'd call, Scott would answer and he'd say, I'm really annoyed. I told your flatmate to give this message to you. It was really urgent. And he'd say, well, when did you ring? He said, I rang you on Saturday. And he said, well, my flatmate, you know, he's several states away. He's gone to see his family. He's not been here for the past week or so. And I was out all that day. So you can't possibly be called here. Or certainly he wasn't here to take the call. So they realized in studying these that they were becoming more familiar with these types of calls as they occurred. You were noticing them more. The more you knew what types of calls would kind of crop up, unusual events. So for me, I, I threw into the mix um, mixed calls, type four mixed calls, and that's where you could have a combination of type one and type two calls. So that incredible case that I mentioned that lasted two to two years in length, that wasn't a one-off, it was repeated. And even though the person knew that the person was dead, they could have extended conversation. So that's a mixture of type one and two. They, even though they knew the person was dead, it wasn't short, it was prolonged. So there were just mixed calls. I just said now and then you could get a mixture where you know the person's dead, but they might call you more than once and you can have a full conversation with them. It isn't brief. And then beyond that, they don't involve um, the dead. They had a, a final one. So for them, it was type four. I've now shifted a, it ahead in the rankings and called it type five. These are intention calls. You intend to call someone, but at the, the time that you intend to call, you, for whatever reason, put off the call. You've got a specific conversation in mind, and you go and do something else and think, I'll call them later. But at the time you intended to call, that person receives a call from you. And this has happened with voicemail messages or someone taking a message. And it happened for Scott Rogan. And it's one of the classic ones I quote, but I've, I've quoted some other great ones as well. But his was that um, it, it was like four in the afternoon. Uh, no, no, sorry. Um, Ten in the morning, he intended to make the call. Four in the afternoon, he, he got a call that came in. And it was from the research assistant of someone at um, the... Um, a neuro, neuropsychiatric institute at UCLA and uh, they said oh I'm answering your message Scott he said what do you mean you're answering my message and he said well I, I took a note here you called at 10 o'clock this morning asking to speak to this particular psychologist about this we're, we're just returning the call what's up and he said I haven't made any calls I intended to I never actually did uh, his explanation for the whole call is really drawn out and kind of details it far better than I've explained it. But that, again, for him as the researcher, he was just flabbergasted. It was like, I did intend to make the call. I went and did some marking instead. But it's just weird that they're saying that they got a call from someone giving my name, my message, and then my number to call back. It, it was just bizarre. So these are the kinds of calls that can take place. 
um, within anomalous calls. And from doing various um, analyses, content, automatic analysis, it's it's one method, uh, two different methods of qualitative design and social sciences. We found that these themes are, are really consistent. And there's only a few things that might fall outside of that. You know, the answer phone messages, some people getting text messages, they're related to that technology, but they've only come in in recent years. And then you might have um, haunted locations that have telephones that play up, but no specific conversations when you pick them up. So again, there's relationships to the telephone calls, but not like conversations we get um, in general. What have you and your colleagues uncovered that are the theories for these calls? Um, well, they had loads of eventual explanations. I mean, some were um, um, expectancy and misinterpretation. So those would definitely fall in line for people that had a type one call. If you were in an obvious state of grief, you've just lost that person, they typically occur within that 24 hours of loss. And um, there's even people like, um, it was Robert Baker, he put the idea in his book, Hidden Memories Forward of Intentional Amnesia. And that if you are at home alone grieving for this person, particularly if it's a long-term spouse that's died, that it could be a call company just offering you double glazed windows or anything like that, trying to sell you something. And you're, you just pick up the phone and you're just going, yeah, yeah, you're just answering affirmative to everything they're saying. But in your head, you're thinking it's the deceased calling you to giving you a final goodbye. I think, though, that's a really weak theory. It's something he was quite insistent on in his book. But there's no way of supporting that theory whatsoever. In some cases of type one, there have been additional witnesses there. And they said, you know, this is so weird. You know, I can hear so-and-so on the line, you know, who's just died and some other people have heard it. Or they were very clear and very adamant that they had the call. They're clearly not bereft to the point that they can't rationalize what go what's going on. So they called the phone companies immediately and said, you know, where's this call come from? The call companies will say, well, we've got a record of all your other calls, but the one you're saying came in at 3.15, we've got no record of that. So it seems, for Rogo and Bayless, they said beyond that and beyond um, any other conventional explanations they brought up, maybe we're producing it. So let's rule out survival of death for a minute. Let's say you're in such a state of grief, you want a final goodbye. Psychokinetically, so the ability to affect people or the environment with your mind, and a typical uh, example of this is spoon bending, the mind over matter. We are making the telephone, like with the early cases, the telephone bell ring, and usually the one closest to us, and that's enough to get you up out of your seat to go and answer it. Beyond that, maybe you hallucinate the rest of the call, or something like that. It is just one idea if that person's alone, and it just seems so, so real to them. Um, so the, there's no way of uh, saying otherwise. Beyond that, they also looked at paraphysical theories that related to early seance rooms or trance mediums where when the medium goes into trance um, or sometimes with physical mediums, you have a voice that no one can figure out where it's coming from. It's not actually coming from the medium. It's being produced in the room somewhere. Right. Is a similar thing happening with the telephone? Beyond that, if we are suggesting that um, consciousness is surviving beyond death, some researchers have postulated the idea, um, even Oscar de Argonal, who was a, a medium in Brazil in the 1920s, who wrote a book on receiving communications from the dead specifically and only over the telephone, that somehow the dead were capable of manipulating the electrons within the line to produce recognizable speech and voice characteristics. So Rogo and Bayliss took this on and sort of carried that theory a bit further. But that's after we've filtered all the other explanations down, that's our kind of... That's the thing we've got left. And that's kind of feel where I feel I am with that case about Dr. Jones. You know, we're left with some sort of parapsychological explanation, but I can't put my finger on it. Because just because it seems to suggest we have a case of psychic processes, the case tells us nothing about where those psychic processes are coming from. Was it Dr. Jones's mother because she was so bereft? Or is it indeed survival of death? You, there's no way of saying one or the other. We just know that potentially a psychic process is taking place. Um, so those are the main theories that have been put forward. And with most parapsychological conclusions, when you have ruled out all the conventional explanations of psychology, physics, and anything like that, you're left with a parapsychological phenomena and nowhere for us to budge. But this comes back to what you said about some of your um, you know, uh, university professors, college professors, uh, and how long um, psychology and some of the other sciences have been about. If you were to put all the other sciences on a continuum, and parapsychology in terms of how long that's been about. People say it's not made any advances. It's, they even say it's a pseudoscience when in fact it never yeah. uses, it, it uses scientific methods. There's nothing pseudoscientific about it. 
Um, they say it, it's not made any advances, it's not discovered anything, it never finds repeated results, again, which is it, all a load of nonsense when you kind of thoroughly read into the research. Um, put it on that time continuum, and against the other sciences, it's barely been about three months if we were to condense it into a timeline. Mm -hmm. So if it's been about three months compared to the other sciences, in that three months alone, it's made some incredible findings. We found that in a time of bereavement, at least 50 to 55% of people report having an anomalous experience. It is a consistent thing. Within that, people um, most often report the sense of presence of the deceased as an experience. Um, that's the most common one. We know that when we test people in the lab for psychic phenomena, if you can alter their state of conscious awareness through meditation, psychedelic reactants, relaxation techniques such as the Gansfeld, it's a psych-conducive state. We can produce really good, statistically significant results suggesting psychic processes were taking place. If we put someone in an altered state, that seems consistent. At Northampton, we've been testing remote viewing. Our main five studies on that, no other studies looked apart from that, all of them have been statistically significant. When we put someone through the Gansfeld, it seemed we could make them remote view. Um, so we have some theories that are consistent. We, we're just digging deeper. The answer will always be in, in neuroscience. If we want to know what's going on, we need to know what areas of the brain are responsible for this, how and why. You know, why do we need these psychic experiences at points? Are they beneficial to our survival um, while we're alive? Um, and is it beneficial to our survival in some way for the, the mind to keep on after death? What's the purpose of that? Um, so there's so many unanswered questions, but we're, we're a baby science. We're just right. starting out. Um, 120 years of being about isn't a long time compared to the other sciences. So we're making some fantastic advances, even in that time that we've been about. Well, that's interesting. You know, you've explained some of the, uh, the criticisms that's involved, you know, pseudoscience, stuff like that. But what's your – go a little bit deeper into what are some of the criticisms that you've had to deal with, as well as what is your personal interpretation or opinion of this research? Oh, I mean, one of the main ones, the students, we have to slap them on the wrist straight away when it comes to assignments and, and studying parapsychology after two years of studying psychology and say, whatever you do, uh, I don't know if I, I can mention any specific website, so I'll just say a, a, a leading website that offers all kinds of information, <clears throat> some sort of pedia, <laughs> and um, it, um, it is usually people's first port of call for most things, and go on there for parapsychology. And it is full of absolute nonsense, and it is run by what have been termed as guerrilla skeptics, some of which are paid to make sure that it does not have the correct information about parapsychology. So we told students, don't you ever dare reference that, because we will see that you've got the information from this specific site that's full of inaccurate information by the guerrilla skeptics that don't want the truth to be out there. And they'll just reference common sources from an opinion saying, you know, we just thought this research was nonsense because of X, Y, and Z rather than discrediting the original research paper itself, which they can't do. Just because some modern skeptic says they don't believe it, that's the ultimate answer. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Society for Psychical Research has um, made their own um, website that's got all, all the leading information on to counteract this other one. Really hard to say it without mentioning it, but everyone, everyone knows what it is. So that's one of the main things I've been up against. I get really annoyed when I see websites with misleading information. And... Um, I, I constantly get things such as um, there's no evidence for this. I, I've been at house parties before and stuff like that, and people say, what do you do? And if I'm up for an argument, I'll say my job's – I'm a parapsychologist. If I'm not up for an argument and I want to be left alone, I'll say I'm a psychologist. Um, but I remember one time saying I'm a parapsychologist, and they said, well, what's that then? And I explained it, and they said, that, you know, that's all nonsense, mate. There's, there's no evidence for that. And I said, well, you're more than welcome to come to the University of Northampton and look at anything we're doing. Or I could take you to the journal section, and you can peruse through as, as many papers as you want. And they said, but there's no evidence for it, though. And I said, no, you're not listening to what I'm saying. You're more than welcome to come and look at the evidence. There's loads of it. And he said, I don't care, though. There isn't any. I'm like, but that's just self-denial. I've just told you where it is, and I'd well, you know, I'll happily drive you there if you want to come along one time when I'm going to work. Um, and I remember the guy left the party. He, he was really annoyed with me. Uh, the fact that that was my full-time living, a parapsychologist. And his belief system had been, there's no evidence for psychic phenomena, there's no evidence for life after death, and there's no research being conducted in this either because it's nonsense, so we should never pursue it. So he's grown up thinking that or whatever else. I, I, loads of, I don't call them skeptics, I call them cynics. 
because a skeptic would sort of have that open mind to say, here's the for and against, and here's what you're presenting, and, and then consider the evidence. The cynic doesn't even want to look at the evidence. The cynic has already made up their mind. And anyone that I spot in science that has a cynical mindset, I just don't want anything to do with them. I want to be miles away from them because they present bad practice as a scientist anyway. Because if they're so driven by their own beliefs, it means that when they say, I want to study this, I've got a hypothesis that this will happen. They will act so much on that hypothesis that I am going to find this. Well, if you go out adamant that you're going to find something, then typically your research will go that way. It's called an experimental bias effect. You will lead your research down that route. You'll influence your participants, even unconsciously, to the point that they might start to figure out what you're doing. And that can happen both ways. If, if you desperately believe you're not going to find something, and that's happened with the sort of cynics versus the, the believers in parapsychology, where some people in parapsychology who are very definite that stuff's going on sometimes get fantastic results. Those that believe that nothing's going on and mind doesn't survive death and these psychic um, occurrences have got other explanations, they don't tend to find anything. The best research seems to be from those people that don't really care either way. They just stay middle ground and they want to consider everything and give it a fair evaluation. And uh, yeah, loads and loads of criticisms. And it's great though when you see these students taking the course. The, what I've got at the moment, they're third year students. This is one of four other modules and the dissertation they're taking. Some of them take the course because they've had experiences. Some of them take the course because of stuff they've seen on TV. They've, they've loved popular shows on it. They really want to know the science behind it. And um, some of them join, join the course because they are cynics and um, they've studied all these other areas of psychology and they think that they can outsmart the lecturer or demonstrate it to be a load of nonsense. And by the end of the course, once they've gone through 20 classes and 10 different seminars that are interactive, they cannot discredit the research. I find it incredible every week when I've gone through history such as J.B. Ryan's research and outlined his findings step by step, the statistics behind it, uh, and even the spontaneous stuff, uh, ghostly events and the haunting phenomena that were studied. I'll say to the class, criticize this. Any questions, comments? I'm there before a class of 50 to 60 students. Not a single hand will go up sometimes. And you're just shocked. And I said, really? You're just accepting of this? You accept it. What I've said, you accept that perfectly. That someone saw a ghost and then several other people did and said, therefore, it was a ghost and definitely there are ghosts. You know, something like that. And it's incredible sometimes how people just get caught in the headlights by this research that they had no idea was going on so deep below the surface of what they get in the media or something like that, which often is the only level people want to go to to understand something. They'll watch a documentary or something like that. And it's all down to how it's edited as to what they're going to get. You want to dig deeper, get the books, get the journals. Don't get popular books, get the books written by those doing the research. And for the students, it's great to see them go through that transition. By the end, they all have so much respect for parapsychology, how it's informed a lot of psychology's own studies using statistics and also tightening your research methods, making sure there's no room for er error, fraud, deception, and so forth. But what we've got is so controlled that when it comes to the outcome, one of the main things we're left with is that it must be a, you know, some sort of psychic anomaly because we can't account for anything else. Um, very rewarding when I get that, but I'll always be faced with the other arguments. Yeah, it, it was, you know, like, like you said, once you delve into the research and the studies that's there, it's hard to deny it. Um, you know, I've had conversations with Dr. Calvi Persetti, and he's discussed that, you know, he didn't believe in any of this. His wife brought up about, you know, wondering if there was life after death. So he decided to do some research, and he was intrigued. And he, he said he's written, uh, not written, but he's read over 24,000, 21,000 studies and papers on evidence to support that there is life after death, to support that there is communication with the other side from engineers, scientists, doctors, psychologists, to all forms and walks of life that have supplied that type of research. Mm -hmm. So it is out there. And like you said, and this is the biggest thing, I run into this in my lectures as well. You know, people say, well, there's no evidence. And I says, who told you that? And it always comes back to, you know, the James Randi Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I say, okay, what is the James Randi Foundation? You know, and, and respect and no respect to them is, you know, he's a trickster, he's an illusionist, he's a magician. So their whole thing is propaganda, but I commend them on going after the frauds that are out there, but you can't then go after everybody assuming that they're a fraud because you know, 
other people know that have actually spent time in this, dedicated their life to us, that there's plenty of research. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I got so much of Randy with the students as well and, and just show, you know, he had an interesting involvement and kind of still does, but not as much as he, he did with parapsychology. And he just kind of ruined a lot of things, really. And I said, you know, bear in mind, this guy's a magician. He's not a, a scientist or another psychologist that wants to put a spin on things. He's just saying, I can replicate it. Therefore, that's what these people claiming they can do it genuinely are doing, just because I can replicate, replicate what you're seeing visually. And um, I think the most interesting one was, I've forgotten what research re department it was, and that's really bad of me, um, but it was a university department that was dealing with parapsychology, and it was all called Project Alpha. And he got two uh, young um, college yes, students. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, yeah and, and got them to practice some sleight of hand for spoon bending. And the, they were asked to go into the university, and they were told at any point, if anyone says, are you doing this via trickery, you are to say yes. And... Uh, the parapsychologist there, they just said, okay, just show us what you can do in, in loose conditions. This was literally just an office meeting. And um, then later on, they decided to start the lab study, and they obviously had trouble because they didn't have the genuine abilities, and the only way they could do it was when no one was looking and quick sight at hand. And they, they never published on this. They never said that the students were genuine, but because it got to a full study, I can't remember if they either said we're doing this via fraudulent means or someone said you know is this are you doing this via sleight of hand but randy just said look a parapsychology department's taken on these magicians i've trained them to be magicians for this type of ability and they've gone in and they've fooled the parapsychologist no paper was even produced so they would have been caught out by the fact that they couldn't do it in in the control setting but because of that the funding got dried up the department was closed instantly so a department that was trying to do something so honestly and got closed down just because some, um, in my opinion, idiot decided to send two students in uh, and kind of ruin it. I mean, you could do that with, with any other right. department if you want to. Someone claiming they've got some mental disorder and pretending they've oh, got it. Oh, aspirin, they... studies for pharmaceuticals. Wow, yeah, I feel sure. better. I feel better, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, why? Wow, then this thing cured you. Wow, you feel better, you know. Yeah, it's, well, he's a trickster. And, and that's what he was doing was showing that he's a trickster. It's what he does well. Um, so, you know, there's no reason to even discuss it any further, but for people to understand that even the skeptics themselves, uh, they are trying to create these things to then point the finger saying, see, see, we told you, we told you, but yet they're manifesting it. They're creating that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you've got your book, Telephone Calls from the Dead, Conversations with Ghosts and Paracoustics, Sound and the Paranormal. Where, where can people pick up these books? Uh, they're available on Amazon.co.uk and on Amazon.com. Um, they're all in different formats. I mean, uh, phone calls from the dead. I would like it if in uh, my PhD is rounding up now, a few more months, and I'm finished. And <laughs> been procrastinating so much writing these books and other things. But uh, telephone calls from the dead. I hope that soon there'll be a Kindle edition of the original one, and then later on I will be doing a revised edition, adding more chapters, doing more analyses. But Conversations with Ghosts, um, that's paperback and Kindle. And Paracoustics, you've got a choice of hardback, paperback, and Kindle as well with that. And more books to come as well. I'm just finishing off a, another previously unpublished book by Dr. Alex Tanis called Paranormal Psychotherapy. And um, I'm just writing the foreword at the moment with uh, Dr. Stanley Krebner from Saybrook University. And uh, it's a document that's needed to come out for a long time. Really interesting clash of a psychic offering psychic diagnoses for people that went under psychiatric treatment. Um, so, you know, ethical nightmare in terms of trying to do that today, sure. but is an interesting and unique um, stepping stone for parapsychology of its time. And that, and you know, I've got a list of other books that need writing that I've been asked to. And once this PhD is done this next year, there'll be more coming out when I get the time. Fantastic. You know, and thank you for all the contributions that you're doing. Now, people can get a hold of you at uh, your Twitter at at Callum E. Cooper, that's C-A-L-L-U-M-E-C-O-O-P-E-R. And uh, I see here your website's down. Is it going to be up again? Or um, there's, uh, I'm going to develop one from scratch soon. I think there'll be a new one up because currently there is no website. Okay. No, understood. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people can get hold of you through Twitter. They can pick up your books at Amazon.com. Any last words? Um. I think we've covered so much, but for anyone listening, I mean, thank you so much for kind of um, taking the time to listen in to the things that are going on in this research. I don't know if parapsychologists are kind of the most interesting in the paranormal world to listen to because it's all studies and numbers, but 
you know, yeah, by showing an interest, you're, you're making a contribution that there's something to be studied here, especially in sharing your own experiences that you've had. It's just highlighting to the world how common these experiences are. Sure, they'll have various explanations for how they occurred, but for psychology and parapsychology, it's important that people come forward and say, I had a ghostly experience, this is what I encountered, or I suffered a bereavement and then this happened, or I had a premonition of this and then it came true. If you don't tell anyone about it, we don't know about it, and it's important that this, this data, these experiences are constantly highlighted so we can make advancements and we can learn more. So um, that's it. It's been fantastic speaking to you, Chris, and thanks to the listeners for tuning in. No, thank you. And I do want to. I do want to add. You know, I've worked with Lloyd Aubach and Pamela Heath, oh, some great. other uh, Barry Taft, and some other psych parapsychologists that I've worked hand in hand with. And you know, you know, even my listeners know I always pay the respect to parapsychologists because they are the true ones out there doing the research, turning in the papers to the journals, holding the conference, and keeping up with the studies. Ghost hunters aren't doing that. They're just, you know, looking at some of the evidence, dealing with ITC, but they're not actually writing the papers and submitting to the journals. It is the parapsychologists that are keeping all of this really going. So I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Steve Parsons could give you a massive debate on <laughs> ghost hunters versus parapsychologists. <laughs> That's another time. Another time. <laughs> That's another time, another place. Well, li listen, thank you so much. I wish you all the best. You've been listening to Chris Fleming and Cal on Spirit Talk. See you next month.